Welcome to Brian Lehrer Live, where web video meets the issues. Tonight, all the president's pixels. Will the web still work magic for Mr. Obama now that his address is .gov? Also, self-help for the recession. We offer guidance on getting the right education for tomorrow's workplace, plus advice on stress, how to float through hard times. Maybe picture a restful place. meditate on that more later, but first, here are this week's online video picks. Number one and number two are online political commercials. One Democrat, one Republican, both excerpted from interviews. The Democratic National Committee is out to prove that the Republicans have no alternative to the Obama stimulus plan. Number. Well, um, the, a budget without numbers, I think, isn't that like selling a car without wheels? It does not have, in the, in the sense of a traditional budget, numbers. Well, it certainly was short on details, and I think they would have been better not to put it out there until they, they, they fill in the blanks. I am very frustrated, Mike, because I w we've been waiting for this. We cut away from the president to hear the big buildup. Republicans have a plan. They have ideas. They're not the party of no. They wanted to rush and get in front of the cameras, and because they did, they made fools of themselves. Here it is, Mr. President. A glossy blue pamphlet, but it was light on specifics. And it may just be that it's a time for new leadership just because they need clean leadership. Yeah, Gene, a lot of these people follow George Bush's deficit spending. That's classic politics. The party out of power snipes at the party in power, but offers no concrete alternative so no one can snipe back at them. But there they did. The New York Republicans also have an interview clip they've been touting. The target here is Democrat Scott Murphy, who was running for Congress in yesterday's election to fill U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand's House seat near Albany. Murphy was not at his best with conservative talk show host Fred Dicker. So if the terrorists who, say, destroyed the World Trade Center in the 9-11 attack had been captured, you don't think they should have faced the death penalty even though they killed some 3,000 people? Yeah, I mean, as I say, it's a tough issue, but I think why at the end of the day... It, uh, why is it a tough issue? Well, I mean, because I think that we, you know, we, we so often deal with cases where the evidence may not be totally conclusive and we, we can't prove for beyond any shadow of a doubt that, uh, that we don't that's have not something the legal that we can standard. come up with later. And, and also I think that the cost is just not accurate for it. Okay, so I mean, you would be against so much the death more penalty for putting someone away that it's a it's a big expense. Okay, so you're against the death penalty for terrorists. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. And how, you may be wondering, did the first house contest since the election of President Obama yesterday turn out? A virtual dead heat between Scott Murphy and Republican Assemblyman James Tedisco. Bring out the paper ballots and lawyers. I never dreamed it would be like Minnesota in the Adirondacks, did you? Video pick number three. The new Yankee Stadium and the Mets City Field both open this week. Want a sneak peek? Here are some video tour highlights from TVJersey.com. Basically, they said the whole time we wanted to kind of channel Yankee Stadium as it was in 1923. So the architecture, the way it looks, like the section numbers, the section names, a lot of that stuff is the same because they wanted to keep their tradition. Even the placement of some of the ads along the mm -hmm. along the um, 
stands are the same. But the, obviously the, the thing is, it's this five-star structure. It's, you know, 62% bigger than the old one. You know, wow. things like 16 elevators instead of two. It has a 59 foot by 103 foot screen. Each of the, com you know, players has a little computer screen at, at their locker. So basically it's, it's channeling the feeling of the old Yankee Stadium, but it's, you know, completely upgraded. Watching the video, the thing that struck me was I, I sort of, uh, you know, expected to see something new, but it looked, especially the field shots, it looked like it didn't. I didn't feel like I was looking at anything new. It felt like I was looking at an old, an old stadium. It almost didn't look very different from the old, from the Yankee Stadium that they're now tearing down. People are obviously asking us the question, you know, how is it like Shea? What's the comparison? Uh, we feel it's incomparable on a number of different levels. Forty-two thousand seats de facto brings you closer to the field than. Uh, what we had at Shea, which was 57,000. And even if the seats yeah. at Shea were built to the contour of the field, more seats mean further up and further out. And the notion was uh, to create an environment where at every level of the ballpark, fans were closer to the action. It's built as a pitcher's park. What you see, the orange line hit it over and it's gone, hit it under and it's in. In terms of the inspiration for certain things, as you came in, you probably saw the exterior of the building, which is the Jackie Robinson Rotunda, reminiscent of Ebbets Field. Actually, now that we, the people, own Citigroup, the Mets are renaming that stadium Debits Field. April Fool's. Video pick number four, blog it your way. Blogger Alfred Sirleaf in Liberia blogs his on a blackboard when necessary. We found out about the blackboard blogger from a recent post on whiteafrican.com. Why does he blog in the war-torn country? Simply because I saw the need of the people. There are Liberian people that are out there doing a the war prior to the war. That was some some years back, 2000, before 2000, I started my research. I, I interacted with the people in displaced camp, in refugee camp, and I saw that actually they needed somebody to inform them. They want to participate in both community and national development. But there were no ones who gave them the, the, this, the, this means of being informed. What you're looking at right now, presently, this is just the, 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 the chalkboard newspaper component of Daily Talk. We got different, different components there, you know, but this is just a chalkboard newspaper. And for now, this is just an example. But our objective is to decentralize this. This is only uh, located within a single vicinity. But we have other communities that have 20,000, 10,000, up to 100,000 populations. And we want to make sure this chalkboard newspaper is decentralized to this area so they can have access to it. And video pick number five, a songwriter named Jonathan Mann in San Francisco is on a binge, writing a song a day right now and posting it to his YouTube channel called The Rock Cookie Bottom. This one jumped out at ABC News, which played it on Sunday for one of their guests, a certain economist. Hey, Paul Krugman, why aren't you in the administration? Is there some kind of politicking? That I don't understand me Timothy Geithner Is like some little weasel And wasn't he in a position of power And all this shit went down in the first place When I listen to you Things seem to make sense I listen to him All I hear is blah, blah, blah You talk good, man Where the hell are you, man? Cause we need you on the front lines Not just writing for the New York Times I feel better if you were calling some shots Instead of writing your blog and probably thinking a lot I mean, don't you have some influence? Why aren't you Secretary of the Treasury? For God's sakes, man, you won the Nobel Prize Timothy Gardner uses turbo tanks And those are this week's online video picks. This is Brian Lehrer Live, where web video meets the issues. Early last week, President Obama put out the word that the White House was open for questions. He said the idea was to promote an online town meeting to be held last Thursday. It happened, and 92,000 people submitted questions. Far more voted for their favorite questions. We took votes about which questions were going to be asked, and I think 3 million people voted, or... 3.5 million people voted. I have to say that there, there was one question that was voted on that, that ranked fairly high. 
uh, and that was whether legalizing marijuana would improve uh, the economy <laughs> and job creation. And uh, uh, I don't know what this says about the online audience, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, I just want, uh, I don't want people to think that uh, this was a fairly popular question. We want to make sure that it was answered. Uh, the answer is no, I don't think that is a good strategy to grow our economy. So, Marijuana aside, can the web become as effective a tool for a President Obama as it was for candidate Obama? With us via Skype from Washington, D.C., Julie Barco, Germany, director of the Institute for Politics, Democracy, and the Internet. Julie, thanks very much for coming on with us. Welcome to the program. Thanks. Glad to be here. So is this truly interactive? I mean, the White House did pick the questions out of those tens of thousands, right? Sure, and it's definitely more interactive than the kinds of things that we've seen coming out of a White House in the past. People actually spoke online to the administration and asked a question. But it's not the end-all, be-all of interactivity. At the end of the day, those questions were carefully guarded and selected by people within the White House, even though there was public voting. So what we saw is a combination of a very savvy use of a new medium, the internet, and web video, a level of interactivity, but at the end of the day, it was still carefully choreographed performance. On the voting, Julie, does the fact that the marijuana question got voted by far number one discredit the process of voting to some degree? I mean, I support reform of marijuana laws, but it's hardly, hardly our most pressing issue. Yeah, well, you know, there are some very active communities of users on the Internet, the kinds of people who really like to engage with these tools. And one of those communities tends to have a slightly more libertarian bent, and they tend to feel very strongly about the marijuana issue. And it's very easy for them to organize themselves to take an action like voting on something, like they did um, with the online web-enhanced voting for the town hall meeting last week. But then what is it representative of? <laughs> I think it's representative of one community of interests online that happens to be very active users of the technology. Maybe they're uh, lacing it with meth these days. I don't know, <laughs> making them so active. Anyway, big picture, how well has Obama.gov used the web as opposed to Obama.candidate? <laughs> well, WhiteHouse.gov is still in this growing pain stage. It's incredible to transition from the life of a campaigner to the life of an elected official, from the life of somebody working on the campaign to the life of somebody working on the administration. So all of those promises and good intentions, the spirit of openness and transparency and interactivity that many people feel the Obama campaign brought to electoral politics is slowly being transitioned into the Internet. But what people don't realize is that there are rules and structures and ways of doing things once you're in elected office that prevent you from turning around in one month or two months or even three months and throwing up the White House equivalent of your own Facebook, like MyBarackObama.com or YouTube. So they're doing it bit by bit, piece by piece, but we're never going to see the level of interactivity that we saw in the campaign. Other presidents used to do Saturday radio addresses. Barack Obama now does a Saturday radio and Internet address. Is this turning into an FDR-style fireside <laughs> chat for today or not really? You know, I think it has the potential to become that fireside chat for the day. How many of us actually listen to the radio on Saturday anymore? Probably not as many of those of us who are on the Internet, either doing homework or communicating with each other or playing that, games that, or if shopping. We do, if we do, it's car talk. It's not the president <laughs> of the United States on 1010 wins. Yeah, you're right. It probably is car talk. But are people going to the web either and watching this in, uh, Internet address either on Saturday or Sunday or any time? You've asked one of the most important questions, and I like to call it the field of dreams argument. Many people say if you build it on the Internet, if you put something on the Internet, people will come. And that's not necessarily true. You can put a bunch of crap on the Internet and people don't necessarily flock to it. We don't know yet how effective these online um, Saturday addresses are. We don't know if they're going to be the next fireside chat. I think the White House is carefully monitoring what's going on. It's hard to tell yet. Is it a matter of marketing? 
You know, it's it's less a matter of marketing than it is a matter of leading a breadcrumb trail. People have to know where to find you. Um, you have to organize people the way you'd organize people to turn out to a campaign event. So I think it's a combination of the organization and probably some marketing too, you know? Some more uh, conversations like this one through different media outlets probably don't hurt. So the first web town hall was big news. Will the second one be? Will the third one be? Will he even do more or was this just kind of a token gesture? It's hard to say what the White House is thinking at this point, but they got such a huge press hit off of that. And they generated so much goodwill in the Internet community, especially amongst their core group of supporters, that I don't see how they can't do something like this in the future. They probably will. Will it get enough attention? Will it get as much attention as it did now? I don't know. Maybe they'll have to ask the marijuana question again. Did he blow that goodwill because he kind of <laughs> laughed off the marijuana question? You know, I don't know. And many people have argued that he actually got off message by answering the marijuana question, that it detracted from the really tough issues that he was supposed to address, issues about the economy and education. Um, you use the phrase Internet community. Is there such a thing as an Internet community? Isn't, by definition, the Internet a series of uh, or a whole you know, collection of widely dispersed communities? I think you're exactly right. There's a a whole collection of widely dispersed communities, very niche targeted audiences that tend to gather together based on things like ideology and interests and less on um, the ways that we gather together in public usually, which is based on geographical location, where we live, where we work. And is um, there going to be a point, do you think, where the Internet community and the American community or the American people are indistinguishable from each other, or is that just not the nature of the medium? From a marketing perspective, this is becoming increasingly the case. What we're seeing is that the Internet audience is looking more and more like the average American voting audience. It's just that we consume different things online. So the consumption of, for example, the Weather Channel online, huge amongst people above the age of, of 60. We found that a lot of these political sites, especially political blogs and news sites, are huge for people between the ages of 30 and 55. And of course, we know that those social media sites, sites like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, um, and Hulu, hugely consumed by a younger demographic. So we're doing different things, but most of us are online. And he is certainly using old media to great effect, too. He's now had two strategically placed primetime news conferences in these first weeks of the administration. And when he does that, virtually every television station, all the major network affiliates, carry it and so you see him in New York on two and four and five and seven and 13 as well as cable channels I mean that's still much more powerful than anything he's doing online at this point isn't it he's a man of all media today we still judge the success of something by whether or not the mainstream media picks up on it and the fact that he's been able to go to so many different outlets online and offline I think speaks very well for how good he is at crafting his personal media strategy and at his charisma there have been some speed bumps in the Obama administration's march to transparency, but he has been opening up a lot of the internal workings of his administration um, on the WhiteHouse.gov site and things like that. Is there something inherently transparent about being online, or do you really have to do it right? You know, this idea of transparency is so important on an Internet environment. It's something that people have begun to expect the more that we use the Internet as American citizens, American voters, and Internet consumers, but it's also become a buzzword. So I think there's something very inherent about that transparency. It's something that we demand and we expect, but at the same time, it's so easy to say, I'm being transparent and just using it to mask what you're doing. You have to actually use the technology to push data out there, to communicate more openly with all American voters and constituents. And I think that's where the battle's going to be. And that's certainly necessary for legitimacy online. Do you think they're really doing it? Have you looked at whitehouse.gov? Have you looked at recovery, what is it, recovery.gov or whatever it is? And these other things, it seems like they announce a new online transparency initiative every week, but I don't know how transparent they really actually are there. 
I think that at the end of the day, the Obama administration is going to be judged on how well it encourages all government agencies to be incredibly open in a very immediate context, so posting data and information immediately, and not just for those agencies for the legislative process as well, posting bills with greater efficiency online and enabling people to sort through them, come to their own conclusions, collect data, and actually give feedback as well. They're, they're getting there. It's, it's a slow start. This can't all be accomplished in one day, but I think that the intention is to keep moving in this direction. If a transparent website grows in the forest and nobody reads it, is there noise? You got to leave those breadcrumbs. You know, it's like Hansel and Gretel. You've got to lead them to where they're going. Otherwise, people aren't going to use it. And, you know, many political scientists argue that most of the American population doesn't want to be that engaged. But for those of us who do want to be the 10 percent, the 20 percent, it's incredibly important to have that information out there. The bloggers, the other journalists will find their way to those breadcrumbs and they'll disseminate the important pieces uh, further and wider. Just tell me one last thing. Did he ever appoint a chief technology officer? He was going to do that, according to his campaign, to make sure that his policies were actually coordinated with transparency and with dissemination on the web uh, and interactivity with the American people. But last I looked, he never appointed that position. Did he ever uh, do it? He did. He's filled the position with somebody named Vivek Kundra. Know anything about Vivek Kundra? <laughs> <laughs> um, Vivek Kundra worked in Washington, D.C. He was the chief information officer for Washington, D.C. for a number of years, and now he's transitioning to the Obama White House. All right. We'll have to get that person on the show. Julie, really th thank you very much for coming on. You're welcome. Bye. Coming up, how to stimulate New York to create the most jobs. This is Brian Lair Live, where web video meets the issues. Watch Canapé, the French cultural magazine show, Thursdays on CUNY TV. Mama was queen of the Mongo, Papa was king of the Congo. Deep down in the jungle, I stopped banging my first bongo. Every monkey like to be in my place instead of me, cause I'm the king of bongo, baby, I'm the king of bongo bong. I went to the big town where there is a lot of sound, from the jungle to the city looking for a bigger crown. So I play CD, but they don't go crazy when I bang it on my boogie. I'm the king of the bongo, king of the bongo. Bong. Hear me when I come, baby. King of the bongo, king of the bongo. Bong. Nobody like to be in my place instead of me, cause nobody go crazy when I bang it on my boogie. I'm a king without the crown, hanging, losing a big town. But I'm a king of bongo, baby. I'm the king of bongo. Smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. This is Brian Lear Live, where web video meets the issues. Now that the Obama stimulus money is reaching state coffers, will it be spent in a way that creates good jobs for New York and the nation? Joining us, Julian Alcid, Executive Director of the Workforce Strategy Center and Applied Think Tank. Julian, welcome to the program. Thanks, Applied man. Think Tank, what do you actually do and to whom does it apply? Okay, well, we, we work, Workforce Strategy Center works with states and regions to help them make their education and training more responsive to the economy. We're really interested in both the supply and the demand, so how can we have more workers with good career track jobs and how can we grow the economy? We work with governors and their teams, with mayors and their teams, and, and, and our work really applies to them. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of resources in this country directed to training and economic development that is typically uncoordinated, and we help them pull it all together. So is the kind of consulting that you do changing in the new economy? 
It is very much changing in the new economy. And the, 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 gone are the days when, when a, 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 someone could have a high school diploma or GED and a career. Uh, the the entry to the middle class now really is um, is, is is a credential beyond high school. Uh, in, in fact, jobs that require an associate's degree or a post secondary certificate um, are growing 60 percent faster than the job market as a whole. So, do you think our usual notion of entry level jobs is outdated? It's definitely outdated. Um, em employers, particularly employers in the knowledge economy sectors, and by, by that I'm really talking largely about um, sectors where sort of entry-level jobs have been digitized. Um, they are they repeat consistently have trouble finding talent, finding a, a, um, skilled talent. Really? So here's a job opportunity for people with the right training. Absolutely. Make that concrete. What are these jobs? Well, you know, there, there's there's well, if we look if we look to the stimulus, where incidentally. 54 percent, according to Georgetown University, 54 percent of the jobs in the stimulus will require some college credential. Um, we're, we're, we're e even just within the stimulus, we're talking about many of the jobs in health, health IT, healthcare, green jobs. I mean, these are these are these are jobs that require some skills. You know, our our the, the people um, repairing our buses or hopefully our green buses are not just grease monkeys; they're computer technicians. They have to be mouse ready as well as shovel. Already Absolutely. these projects, right? Uh, you advocate something called a career pathways approach to helping working class Americans move up. What is career pathways? Sure. Well, job um, training in this country has, has historically been about getting someone a job, usually at the entry level. Um, and, 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 and we believe that we really need to think about the continuum. Um, and, and a career pathway really is a, a connected series of education, training, um, and, and support programs that enable someone to land a good career track job and advance to successively higher levels of education and training. I like, I like to say from K to gray. From K to gray. Um, how, how equipped is New York to deal with all this stimulus money? I mean, we do have job training programs to pour money into, right? We, we do have job training programs to pour money into. In New York, like most states, those programs have not necessarily been spent with regard to really where's the demand, where are the jobs, and to, to moving people into the, the sort of high wage, high, high growth sectors. Um, there's, there's, there's also a challenge of, 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 of money, um, of so much money coming that it overwhelms the system. Uh, if it overwhelms the system, is the money going to get out? Are you saying we're, we're not ready well, to spend all the money we're going to get? Uh, well, 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 you know, we, 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 we better spend all the money we, we're going to get. I mean, in the, in the workforce training system, so to speak, alone, there's a, a, a $4 billion that's coming to, to all the states. New York getting a good chunk of that. There's also money in other pots. There's, there's, I mentioned the green and the health information technology. There's $20 billion in health information technology. The real challenge to policymakers is, in the short term, getting money out right away to pay for those shovel-ready jobs, um, because clearly we, we need to get people who are ready back to work. The real challenge is how are we going to spend this money over the long haul in a way that all these various pots of, of dollars are coordinated and make sense. Now, here's a video clip from Ohio, one of the states that is using that career pathways approach to making sure lower skilled workers wanting to climb the corporate ladder don't get stuck on the bottom rung. I started here in 1995 as a clerical assistant in medical records. Currently, I'm in clinical development and education. I'm a coordinator. It's an administrative role. I help coordinate patient services orientation. Right. Um, this is my first year in the program. We're taking okay. classes over in the Health Professions Academy. Oh, you're welcome. We have the flow sheets. One of the flow sheets that you'll be working with will be intake and output flow sheets. The program offers flexibility. Um, the employer is sponsoring the program, so we don't have to worry about tuition. Me being a single parent, I wouldn't have been able to go back to school having two children in school as well. I wouldn't have been able to do it without the employer sponsoring the program. We are actually developing and growing our own. So I think that's an advantage for us, as well as an advantage for them. You know, they're able to stay within the institution. The institution is supporting them and giving them what they need to be able to advance in the jobs that they're in now and continue um, professionally here. 
the initial feedback that we get from our employees is overwhelmingly positive. They become like little light bulbs, they just light up. And they've always wanted to advance, they've always wanted to have an education, they always wanted to have a job that was higher paying, but they wanted to provide better for their families. And they have that opportunity and support from the organization as well as uh, from the schools has been tremendous for our employees. Do you want to comment on that? You want to elaborate maybe on one of the stories we heard in there, one of the points? Sure. Well, what, what I, um, I like about Cincinnati is it's, it's really a place that's, that's pulled together just what I'm talking about. So there you have the Children's Hospital, which, is, which has a need for talent and recognizes and also has a large number of low-wage, low-skilled workers in their, in their hospital, people cleaning the hospital, people working in food service. Well, they had the foresight to go to connect with their local community. Community College, in this case, a Cincinnati State College, and, and, other, and other governmental agencies that have resources available and have been offering training to their employees, their low-wage, low-skilled employees, that move them into high-wage, high-skilled careers, just like the, uh, the medical records uh, position the woman was talking about. So if I'm in New York and I want that kind of thing for myself or a loved one, who do I call? Well, I, you know, the, the, the first place I'd start is with the community college system. I mean, really, many, much of the credentialing we're talking about is offered in certificate and degree programs at the City University of New York and its various community colleges. The city has, um, around the country, and the uh, city has what's called a workforce uh, system with what they call one-stop centers, and that's a, that's a place to go. The challenge, though, is to, to ensure that you, that you end up in a program where there really is an opportunity at the end, and where that opportunity is going to pay a, a decent wage. And let's talk about what some of those opportunities might be. For example, health care is a field that you've identified as actually growing at this time, even while a lot of other industries are shrinking, correct? Well, it sure is. And, and in, and in health care, what's interesting, you know, we hear a lot in, uh, all around the country about the nursing shortage. I mean, there's just been there's this tremendous nursing shortage, and, and, and nursing programs are, are jammed. Well, there's there's a whole slew of other great career opportunities in healthcare. Um, um, Cincinnati and, and others have, have focused on allied, allied um, health, um, various technician jobs, lab techs and radiology techs and respiratory techs. There's medical records, which is a whole medical administration, which is a world unto itself about to become much more robust as this health IT um, system in this country begins to unfold. That's one of the Obama administration initiatives. In fact, that's one that Democrats and Republicans seem to universally agree on. The electronic medical records frontier needs to be opened up. Absolutely. Um, but what's interesting about that that area is it's 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 it's, it, it's a good example of what I'm what I'm talking about. Um, I actually wrote a wrote a piece uh, not long ago for Huffington Post with a colleague who is a, a, a an electronic medical records expert. Um, and and what we essentially argued is that even among the experts, we really do not have a good grasp on what it's going to take to develop, grow maintain and support a full-blown medical record system in this country. And so what that says is a couple of things. One, places like New York need to be sure that their economic developers and the key healthcare employers are really clarifying exactly what are the needs, what's projected, and that in turn has to inform the training that's done and the general public so they know where to go get good training. So for our unemployed viewers, healthcare is one field that they might consider getting retraining for Absolutely. what else? Oh my goodness! There's well, clearly the, another huge area in the stimulus is 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 green, green jobs, and um, and 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 there's going to be a, a lot of opportunity there, um, and 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 I think. You know, and this, what is this, a green job? Is it a well, roofer? Is it a biochemist? What is a green well, this job? Well, again, it's another area that's really emerging in this country, and I think you know a lot of the initial focus has been on on weatherization, and but but even there, I mean, I, I think that as cities in New York begin and, and begins to think about where its priorities are and where it's going to invest resources, I think we have to look at three factors. One, um, what are the jobs that are going to help grow the economy? Two, what are the jobs that are going to help green the economy? And finally, what are the jobs that are going to help people earn a family sustaining wage? So a green job, you know, one green job is putting tape on windows. That's not going to get a lot of people out of poverty. So can you go to your local community college and say, I want to train to work in the green economy, and they'll know what you're talking about? They should know something about it, and, and hopefully they'll 
know a lot more if our policymakers make sure that they're talking to the people in the industry who, who know what the jobs are and who are developing the jobs and can help, who can help articulate um, and set standards for training and, and then make a good faith effort to hiring the people who are trained to their standards. You were telling us off the air about Rolls-Royce, yes. which moved a lot of its car production to Virginia. And the assumption here in New York would be that, oh, that's because Virginia's in the South, it's a so-called right-to-work state, which means they can bust the unions. Uh, but you think it's for another reason? Well, we, we've actually been working with um, with Governor Tim Kaine and his, his, his cabinet members in his economic and education and training agencies to develop a statewide career pathways plan. And, and, and we had an event to kick off this, 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 this um, planning process. And, and the governor told a story about, about about Rolls-Royce and essentially he said when we were able to lure the Rolls-Royce plant to Virginia it wasn't because we were offering ta better tax breaks or incentives than any other state it's because we were able to definitively say to the to the Rolls-Royce leadership we can provide you with a pipeline of talent and by that I mean their college system their community college system their various training organizations in the state were all lined up to to help from entry-level workers on high so is there a lesson to be learned from that by New York? Well, I think there is. I mean, businesses cite the availability of a skilled workforce consistently as their number one or number two reason for determining where they locate or expand. And I think in New York, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, we have to look beyond simply offering you know, tax breaks and incentives to, to, to come to the city. Are there things that people are training for too much? Well, that's a good question. I mean, you know, there's, there's, it, it really, you know, I'll, I'll waffle on this one. I mean, it really depends on, yes, yes, the answer is yes, and it really depends on, on, on what part of the country you're talking about. I mean, for example, there are, Definitely, you know, um, I, you know, historically, I'm thinking back now to say the dot com boom, uh, which we were very actively involved with here in the city. And you know, everyone and their sister had to have a web development program. Well, you know, the vast majority of organizations that had those programs weren't even connected to the industry. So, and I fear that the same could happen with green. So. Um where should uh, people go for more information? You've raised a lot of interesting points here. You've given people a lot of interesting leads. How can they learn more? Well, people can certainly learn more about um, what, what the sort of work we do at our at our website, which is workforcestrategy.org. I mean, I certainly encourage people in the city to look at the City University website, and particularly there's there's a lot of very strong workforce development programs, and, and also to look at the, the city's one-stop system, which they'll find online. Good stuff. Very useful. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is Brian Lair Live, where web video meets the issues. A few weeks back, we suggested a few do-it-yourself projects that might be fun and save you money. Here's one more, and it might do a third thing. Allow you a moment of relaxation. This is from the do-it-yourself site called Etsy.com. Life can be pretty stressful. Sometimes you need a project that will let you just kick back and relax. To get started, you're going to need three and a half yards of durable fabric. You're going to need 50 feet of rope and a beautiful sewing machine. If you don't have one, borrow one from your neighbor or your grandma. I chose this cotton fabric because it seems like it's pretty strong and I'm hoping it holds me up. I also got some different colors. I'm going to make some of these for my friends. The first thing I need to do is double hem these edges. I'm going to fold this over once and then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to fold it over again. That way it won't, the edges won't rip and I'll be able to have a nice strong side to my hammock. This looks good. Now that I've got the hem all set up, I need to go ahead and make a tube for the rope to go through. So I'm going to fold this over and then sew it down four or five times. Warning, hammocks are dangerous. Proceed at your own risk. To make this work, you want about two poles about 15 feet apart. Go ahead and take your rope and wrap it around your pole a lot of times. If you're using cotton, that'll be really helpful because cotton is a really grippy rope and it'll grip on it real nicely. Then consult a textbook and find a good knot and go ahead and knot it up really good. That way you won't fall down. All right, that's basically it. Give it a good test. Do it again and you're all set to go.
Ow. It turns out I had to learn the hard way that clothesline is not strong enough for a hammock. Make sure you get climbing rope or something significantly stronger so that you don't fall out of your hammock. And remember, you do this project at your own risk. There's nothing stopping you from having a fabulous and relaxing weekend. Go ahead and make up one of these hammocks and then get some friends together and make up even more. Then go have your own urban intervention. Well, despite the fragile shoestring look of that video, Etsy is actually very big in the world of crafts with millions in sales and reportedly bucking the economic downturn. However, most people aren't. When people say these are stressful times, it is literally true. As the stock market fluctuates wildly, so does our blood pressure. How do we keep cool? How do we cool out? and keep well. With us, two experts. Dr. Robert Schachter directs the Stress Centers of New York and teaches stress management at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Jean Anselmo teaches wellness to health professionals. She is a nurse who is certified in biofeedback, also a lay monastic at the Thich Nhat Hanh Order of Interbeing. Welcome to both of you. Thank you Thank very, you. very much for coming. Let me start with the Thich Nhat Hanh <coughs> Order of Interbeing. I know who Thich Nhat Hanh mm -hmm. is, the wonderfully inspirational mm -hmm. Vietnamese monk. Yes. What does he have to do with life in New York? Um, I think he has a great deal to do with life in New York, especially now, because he has really, for those people who don't know, um, he was really the person who brought what is called engaged Buddhism or engaged practice to the West. Um, he brought it also to Buddhism in Asia. I was just with him in, in May in Vietnam in Hanoi, um, watching him moment by moment actually taking this mindfulness, being in the moment, being present no matter what is going on, good, bad, or indifferent, taking a breath, taking a a step and allowing ourselves to take a different point of view, to be a, a presence in whatever is happening. And um, for New Yorkers right now, that's really important. It's a choice point, you know, to be able to take a look at what's going on, to take a look at the stresses we're in, and to in some way be able to be present what's happening, make a choice about how we want to be with it. So um, uh, I would but say. But for a viewer right now mm -hmm. who just lost his job yes. or she's been out of work yes. for six months she's saying yeah. oh what is this Zen stuff going right. to do for exactly. me? Exactly. I think it's very crucial. I just had somebody um, who called me in um, actually in the fall. She was in that very situation. She had lost her job. Um, she was in an administrative position in a nonprofit. Um, was also uh, in a, a, a relationship that broke up and her uh, roommate decided to uh, fall in love with someone and leave so and she was running out of uh, rent to pay so uh, one of the things I couldn't do which your previous guest could do is help her be able to find a different position but what I could do is be able to help her to begin to look at how do we be look at this situation in a way of walking into not knowing in a positive frame of mind. Because the frame of mind, and that's what, going back to Thich Nhat Hanh, what he's talking about, is really how do we bring in each moment our presence, our, our positive awareness into what is happening. And she did that. She, you know, walking into not knowing, walking into a situation that we're uncertain about, where things are falling out from underneath us, is really key. Because when a person is walking into a new job, a new situation, um, Albert Einstein talked about this, we have to have a different kind of consciousness to be able to bring to a situation to solve the problem from the, situa from the consciousness that created the problem, mm -hmm. which is what you were talking about in the last segment as well. How are we going to have a different kind of consciousness, a different kind of approach? And what she was able to bring was a, um, rather than falling into old assumptions, attitudes, behavior, she went into a different frame and was able to bring her best into the new possibility and got great, herself a job. That's a great story. Dr. Schachter, you're a psychotherapist, a psychologist? Psychologist. And you run the Stress Centers of New York. That's correct. Is all psychotherapy, in a way, uh, focused on the stress in your life? Or when you have a stress center, is that somehow different and unique? Well, we deal with stressed people most of the time. It's really uh, a specific program to figure out how to handle stress and how to reposition yourself to it. So there are lots of uh, neat things that people can learn. So we use the word in such a general way. What do you actually mean by stress? Well, it's my, like my daughter said, I, we were talking about this and she said, I know what stress is. She's 16. 
I said, it feels like you're going to have a nervous breakdown every day. I said, yeah, that's, that's close. But uh, <clears throat> stress is a biologic, physiologic reaction. It's really a very primitive, uh, adaptive survival mechanism. And if you think about how it works, picture the caveman and picture seeing the saber-toothed tiger. As soon as he sees this tiger, this guy goes on high alert. Oh my God, saber tooth tiger, better act. Better act. Well, the blood pressure's going up, his blood's pumping, his heart's beating, his breath is short, his muscles are taut and tense and ready to go into action. He has more energy because his pancreas is dumping stored sugar into his bloodstream. Everything you need to survive, to either fight or flee, is activated all the way. The things that he doesn't need, his digestive system, his reproductive system, he's not thinking about sex at all right now. His immune system, they all go on back burner. So when the tiger passes by, his body normally goes back to normal. But in our society, this is where the problem is, people, the tiger doesn't go by. The tiger is the sick mother who has to go into the nursing home. The tiger is that boss who just drives you insane. So people often are on high alert all the time, and that's when they get uh, tremendous problems with immune system, with all kinds of things. Is it an urban thing? Is New York really the stress capital of the world, or is that a myth? Well, you were thinking it's New York well, uh, or a city. Uh, it, it, I, you know, we were discussing that before, and um, actually, you know, if we put our finger in the pulse of, of what's going on in New York, you can hear, you know, a lot more tension in, in people. You can hear it in the, the, the way they cut each other off, you know, um, on, in the, the LIE or the, the number of horns or being on the subway. There's a lot more tension that is going on. But, as you were I, talking I think, about, I stress think, is all over. I think yeah. tension is all over. Yeah. I think this country is in a horrible predicament, and people everywhere are feeling such terror and fear and stress. And the other, the other piece of it, and I was thinking about this as well, um, is that in North Dakota, I know North Dakota's economy has been pretty steady. They, their banks have been much more steady. Their, you know, their uh, joblessness is, is not in the same predicament as we have here. But look at the environmental issues they have. And I think that this is really a key piece in terms of looking at what's going on at this time, is that we're not only having to look at stress in terms of the kinds of pressures we're seeing regarding the economy and what's going on in urban areas. We have to go back and take a look at our interconnectedness and the relationship that we have. And if people want to begin to reduce their stress, they themselves have to first begin to take the, their agency back, that it's an opportunity, crisis is an opportunity for growth, that they can actually learn some new skills to be able to change some things for themselves and, and begin to make things better for themselves. You mentioned immune system responses. Right. What else? Do different people express stress in different physical ways? Sure. Well, when you, when you have stress, there are a lot of symptoms. You get headaches. You get very often back aches, muscle aches, uh, a lot of trouble sleeping, irritability, relationships suffer. Mm -hmm. uh, people have trouble concentrating. They often drink more. They end up doing a lot of things to compensate for the stress that is bad for them. So you're a psychotherapist, and you run uh, these uh, stress center sessions. You do um, coping techniques for um, well, actually, for professionals, right? Well, Workshops. I actually teach um, meditation at the Contemplative Urban Law Program at City University School of Law. So we have an ongoing program there. Believe it or not, it started on September 10th, 2001, the day before oh. September 11th, and we did our first yoga program there. We're all on on funding grants that. Um, we were able to get. Now, wait a minute. I have to go back to that title. Okay. Contemplative Urban, Urban Law. Law. If I hire a lawyer, the last thing I want to do is sit there and meditate. Hey, maybe you would <laughs> rethink that because in some way you want to be able to have a, a lawyer that's clear thinking, that's able to be able to cut through their own tensions and anxieties, to be able to see what's needed in the situation, to be able to discern how's the best approach to be able to solve the problem. And a lot, as there's a whole movement on a number of fronts in terms of self-care, for lawyers to be able to practice self-care, because just as, as um, Robert is talking about, the incidence of drug abuse, alcoholism, depression, suicide, divorce in law is enormous. So you are, is that the kind of person you want to have sitting down trying to figure out your problems with you? 
And where do you start? Let's say someone comes to you, and just right. to take a random example, says, gosh, I host this radio show, this television show, we're always talking about the biggest problems in the world, I can't take it anymore. There where you go, you and we'll say, okay, we'll say, let's look at the things that get you stressed. And we have different catalogs you go through, and we itemize the parts of your life that are stressful. And then we say, well, let's look at how you deal with this stress, and we start looking at the patterns you use. When people are under stress, it's very interesting, the concept of relaxation is, so we teach skills, but the concept of relaxation is very important. Uh, Jane was saying that that's her whole basis is doing that. And there are a lot of different ways people can relax. Part of our belief, though, is it's not the whole picture. I don't think relaxation is enough. Mm -hmm. So when people come in, what we do is look at stress as an overall system problem. And, there are two, and, and to do that, you need to identify the stressors that are going on. Now, there are two kinds of stressors. There are external stressors that are problems, and there are internal stressors, the way we put ourselves under stress when we don't really need to. So the first thing we'll do is teach a certain type of problem solving. So somebody assesses their stress stressors, their problems, and we look at, let's look if there's another way to handle this. So a typical easy uh, situation is somebody comes in and their stress is they're always late. They're always up against a deadline and it drives them crazy. Well, that's pretty simple. They need to learn time management, prioritization, and then I do something else with them. I make them go through the motions. I make them do a homework assignment and that's to get that assignment in that they have the next day or two days ahead, get it in one day early. And we essentially change their pattern for coping with it. Now, once somebody changes that, that whole area of stress is gone. They call this cognitive behavioral therapy, don't they? Well, that's the next Classic. step. The that's next the next step. step. The next step is that the person who drives themselves a little crazy uh -huh. is the person who's on the way to the airport and say, I'm going to miss the plane, I'm going to miss the plane, but there's plenty of time to catch the plane. Or somebody who's very self-judgmental. So for those people, that's exactly what we do is cognitive therapy and teach them to identify the thoughts that are creating the stress. So are you, with them, are you taking them back to their relationship with their mother or their sister? Cognitive therapy stays right in the present. The, the basis of it is that we feel based on how we perceive a situation, but a lot of times if you're anxious or if you're under stress, you don't see things realistically because of the symptom. So it's a very simple system of identifying the thought that underlies the feeling and then replacing it if it's not accurate. All right, Jean, work with me. I'm stressed out mm -hmm. right now. Uh -huh. Give me a technique. Sure. I think there's a few things, and, and uh, the viewers can do it with us, and I think that's really key. Um, one of the things I like to do with the law students and also with the graduates is a three-breath meditation. And it's very easy to begin to do, but it's important for us to do. The first thing you do is you just let yourself really sit in your chair and feel supported. You put your feet on the floor because a lot of times we're not grounded, you know, and you actually allow yourself to feel that you've got support from the chair and from the floor. Sit on your sit bones, lengthen your you, spine up. Exactly. You know where I'm going. And then what the next thing that we do is just take three deep breaths. <coughs> when you're doing that, it's not just... <sighs> You know, it's actually putting your mind with your breath. So you're breathing in and breathing out and breathing in and breathing out. I have a theory. That Wait, the, you didn't do the third I one. Didn't do right. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're really good at what See, you're that's, doing. It's quick, it's quick, quick, isn't quick it? response system. No, but that's really wonderful. But at the same time, it's those three breaths. If we take the time, three breaths, to do that, any, a number of times during the day to give ourselves that self-care. That's the beginning of switching over to the parasympathetic nervous it system. Has to be, it happens to be a wonderful, wonderful thing. One of, one of the things I have people do or ask them to do is take a break every hour for mm -hmm. two or three minutes, just mm -hmm. two or three minutes, but eight times a work day, mm -hmm. and have them go away and essentially take three or four deep, deep breaths, and I combine it with a picture of a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to break that cycle of stress because when stress has the deleterious effects, it comes from it never letting up. And so if you can interrupt the cycle, you can short circuit its effect. Deep, deep breaths. My theory is that the exhale is more important than the inhale but that's not how most people approach it. Well, I think actually any kind of breathing is going to be really important. Inhale, exhale, you know, depending on your school of thought, you know, they'll focus on one or the other, but quite honestly, a lot of times do people don't even know that they're breathing. Yeah, but like if you're inhaling for three, mm -hmm. exhale for 10. 
Well, you could say that. I mean, that's one way of doing it. I think really befriending your breath, which is really important. Being, befriending yourself where you are is really key because just as Robert's talking about, a lot of times people's minds, especially when they're fearful or they're stressed, will go on a kind of a, a rampage and they can't stop it. But being able to say, I want to stop right now. I'm going to let it go. I'm going to be able to quiet myself down. That gives back that kind of agency and that kind of way of working. 30 seconds. Do either of you ever recommend drugs? Drugs. Medication. Say no to prescription drugs. Prescription medication. Oh, well, people need it, absolutely. Drugs, the psychobiology yeah. is really the underpinning of, of a lot. And so you need to have it properly assessed and diagnosed. But in some cases, if people have depression or severe anxiety, there's a biological basis. Well-placed glass of wine or no? Um, I'm concerned about people uh, self-medicating when they're under stress. I think they have to do a reassessment, <laughs> not, to, not for just enjoyment, but when people are self-medicating using that. And people under stress tend to do that a lot. Yeah. Doctor, I've always wanted to say this. Our session is over now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you next week. <laughs> I would hope so. Or that sometime would be great. in the future. Thank you very much, <laughs> both you. of you, for Thank coming you. on. Thank you. Finally tonight, an April Fool's video from the group Improv Everywhere. Don't worry, this is an April Fool's video. This did not happen. The whole video is an attempt to fool the viewer. Thanks for coming out, everybody. Today's mission is called Best Funeral Ever. <laughs> we have found a random funeral that's happening through the obituaries in the newspaper, and we found somebody who looks like they don't have a lot of surviving relatives, so there should just be maybe like a half dozen people who are at this funeral. We're going to bring an extra 30 people. <laughs> Our idea is to make it just an awesome funeral. You guys should act as realistic as you can. It's not over the top. Really pretend like this is your grandfather that passed away and just be somber. You know, if you can cry on cue, cry on cue, but don't make it cartoonish crying. It should just be very realistic and subtle. And hopefully the family members there are going to really feel like their loved one had way more friends than he actually did. All right? Yeah. All right, let's do it. advance that that was an April Fool's joke makes it funny instead of creepy. And that's it for this week's show. We're here live Wednesday nights at 7.30 or anytime online at brianlara.tv. And tune into my daily radio show, 10 a.m. on WNYC. Tomorrow morning, the leader of Germany's Green Party on the U.S. versus the EU at the G20 Summit. That's 10 a.m. on WNYC, 93.9 FM and AM820. Have a great night.